Hey, Foot Clan, it has been a wild off season, but the Woo-hoo! NFL is on the way. And uh, maybe you're late to the party. You got to get ready for your fantasy football drafts. Maybe you didn't think they were coming. Now they're coming and you need some help. And we've got some help for you. The Ultimate Draft Kit uh, is kind of our baby. This is our, our pride and joy. We spent months and months working on this. 100 plus player profile videos, the best rankings in the industry, the most accurate year after year, uh, and always updated. There's some big news today. We've got it updated. For everybody that has the Ultimate Draft Kit, you can learn more about everything that you get, including the app, at ultimatedraftkit.com. Hey, this is Darren Waller, tied in for the Las Vegas Raiders. I am the Wallerus, and you are listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Cuckoo, cachoo! Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. The Fantasy Footballers. Andy, Mike, and Jason back with you for Thursday, July 30th. Hmm. Had to get that one last yeah. July in. <laughs> Have you ever said that in your life? No. No, I don't think so. I th- There's so much going on. Mike, I'm, you just told us it was football time on Tuesday. Yes. It's opt-out time on Thursday. That is true. We are, we, we are finding out who's in and who's out. Which we knew uh, was coming, and we'll talk about the biggest story along those lines so far at the top of the show today. And then some of the other opt-outs of fantasy football significance. We've got the final divisional breakdown. We're getting divisional today. Mm-hmm. With the NFC West. NFC best. Yeah. Take that, NFL. You know, it's funny when you say that. It's like, yeah, pride and joy. But if you're in the NFC West, it's like, boo, I have a lot of competition. Oh, yeah. It sucks. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying like NFC best is the is the best division to be in. I'm just saying... It has the best four pack. I, I of think teams. so. I think so. It's going to be competitive in that division. Uh, Twitter at the FF Ballers. We've been live every day this week, which you can catch uh, on all of our social platforms. Uh, YouTube dot com slash the Fantasy Footballers. You can subscribe, click the bell over there, get all of our episodes, all of our live streams, and we are inching closer to two hundred thousand subscribers. Oh, I thought you were saying 200,000 shows. And also we are, we are inching, inching our mean, way to that as well. Technically, that That's is That's worthy factual. of an announcement. Do yeah. you want to let the Foot Clan, remind the Foot Clan what's coming? What's coming on... Uh, Monday, Jason. Oh, Monday. my You've goodness. got to be here. <laughs> you have, I have, so Jason here's the, the, is blacked out. I, I forgot what we were talking about, but this is great. It really Why is. Why don't you just tell me what you were talking about? <laughs> we're five shows a week from here on out. Ooh. Well, not here. I mean, like Monday. Yes, yeah. Monday, we are every single day of the week, all the way through the end of 2020. So the tell work, your friends. The work week, not the weekend. Though. Tell your friends, <laughs> tell your family, tell your coworkers that it's time to get on the podcast every single uh, day, Monday through Friday. <laughs> okay, thanks. That was clear as mud. Uh, what else do we have going on? I will say uh, last chance. We got today and tomorrow okay. to get over to Foot Clan Vote. Dot com nominate the fantasy footballers for the people's choice and best sports podcast and of course the spitballers for best comedy podcast to make sure you click the button that says you would like to be eligible to vote yes yeah, footlandvote.com you got two days left and you do can, it now and you can do that every day of the week all year long as long as it's the next two days that's exactly yes. how i would say it <laughs> okay let's uh well the, the big headline news and i'll we'll just hit it right at the top is damian williams Faux MVP of the Super Bowl, mm. uh, yeah. running back for the Kansas City Chiefs, has informed the, the team that he is opting out for the 2020 season. <laughs> yeah, this is... Which means... There's, yeah, this is wild, wild, wild stuff. I will let the Foot Clan know. <laughs> Mike Wright, 
Mike Wright had the opportunity that he earned. I mean, you earned the. You're darn right, I you did. You earned the first pick in the rookie what? draft of our dynasty uh, league. Sometimes you got to be the best of the worst, and you were. And so you earned that pick, and uh, you selected Clyde edwards alaire Mm-hmm. And uh, now it's now it's Clyde Edwards. Yes. Solitaire in the background, in the backfield of that team. Oh, that was the only man left. That was that was not bad. I saw your brain. brain My brain was figuring it out. Look, but I mean, so for, Damian's gone for Damian Williams. He's he's making the choice that he has to make for his family, and now we have to react to fantasy football. And the reaction, if you were on Twitter, is holy freaking crap because Clyde edwards alaire was already a second round pick, and you still had to deal with the fact that. Well, maybe Damian Williams is going to be the starter for the first few weeks. Maybe Williams is the starter for half the season. You just you didn't know. But what you knew was that Andy Reid and co. selected De uh, Clyde Edwards-Alaire at the back of the first round over every other running back. Patrick Mahomes said he wanted Clyde Edwards-Alaire on the team. We know that Andy Reid running backs score Tons of fantasy points, as highlighted by Damian Williams as the starting run when he had the started job, and now it's Clyde edwards alaire is a first round pick. Yeah, I mean, he, and, that, and that's not this is not being hot takey. Clyde edwards alaire is now a first round pick. Well, let's take that a step further. All right, buy or sell presented by Pristine Auction. By the way, the, the hype train for Clyde edwards alaire is currently at this stage. <laughs> Watch out! It's not, it's not the little... It was the little baby train. Right. So now it's, it's full-fledged like... This is a bullet train. I'm surprised with your excitement for the Dynasty League, he's not number one on your ranks. But we're going to play buy or sell with Clyde edwards alaire the fantasy... I'm objective. The fantasy... He's number two. Imp implications <laughs> of Damian Williams' opt-out. And... To me, I said this right when it happened, when we were in the office, there is a, this is almost like we, we spend some of these off seasons trying to just decipher backfield situations. We knew we had limited training camp. Mm -hmm. We already talked about what are we watching in training camp for the limited time that we have. And you have all these conversations about rookies and can they acclimate and can they earn a position? This just feels like a bit of a gift to fantasy owners to have, you know, uh, and obviously every player, we wish Damian Williams the best. Every player is making a decision for their family, their circumstances, um, and what's going on. But for fantasy decision-making purposes, we know Clyde Edwards-Alaire is going to have the opportunity. So buy or sell, Clyde Edwards-Alaire is a top buy. six <laughs> fantasy running I had, I had back. I get it in before Jason. Top buy. six. Oh, I, oh are, do you have him as top six? I, uh, I interrupted I you. mean, that, that is that is the segment. Um I actually do not have him in the top six, but he is just on the outside. All right. After revamping the Kansas City Chiefs roster uh, with this news, I have Clyde Edwards-Alaire at running back seven. So this is not an outlandish spot. Think about when uh, you know Spencer Ware opted out <laughs> a couple years ago. Oh, making come on. that's brutal. <laughs> yeah. That is brutal. Take that Spencer Ware when he oh, got injured. Mean. When, when he got Boo. injured and Kareem Hunt ended up being the rookie sensation. He finished that season as the running back four in half point scoring. So this is at, uh, the, the I think the the top six is the important marker that we are looking at here because you know we always talk about a running back one because there's 12 teams in a league, but it doesn't you want one of the best guys and he certainly certainly can get there. He's higher draft capital than Kareem Hunt was. I think he's a better receiving back but not as good as a runner well let's, so yeah yeah go ahead sorry I didn't mean to cut you off so when I looked at I went back and I looked at Andy Reid's coaching history of the running back one and every year when it wasn't a uh, you know a timeshare when there was a clear leader and what those averages for rushing attempts for uh, targets for touchdowns and in, in both and uh, you know I have him basically running the ball fewer times than Kareem Hunt did catching the ball more times than Kareem Hunt did, and, and it puts That's him at running back seven for me. Yeah, and this is not, you know, Clyde edwards alaire had a lot of hype, and the reason was is you had, you know, Andy Reid, what Jason just talked about, Patrick Mahomes, Super Bowl champions, the skill set running, 
receiving. But fantasy owners should understand like high draft capital running backs perform for fantasy, even when it's not, you know, these five chemicals combined for the explosion. It Leonard Fournette was the number eight overall running back in his rookie season. Christian McCaffrey was eleven. Zeke was number two as a rookie. What was Barkley? Uh Saquon, I, I do have that up here. Let me he I was mean, two. Be, yeah. Barkley was number two. So th- it's not outlandish to be a top six running back as a rookie anyways. When you combine that with all of the other factors here, you're catching passes from the best quarterback in football. You're in an offense that has proven, what is it, 12 of 16 years that Andy Reid's run an offense that your running back's a top 12 guy. You could buy or sell you know, individually. You're making the decision at home. Is he a lock as a top 12? I think he's a lock as a yeah, top 12, yes. barring injury. I have him at seven, though, as well. So I don't have him inside the top six, and that is – Really, just a factor of the other running backs involved that I yep. that we like a lot, and, and I get it. He ended up at number five for me, so I'm buying him as a top six running back. The the you might ask, okay, well, who's who's the odd man out? And for me, right now, it's Alvin Kamara. Dalvin Cook went back to number four for me after the news came in that he's there. He like he's already taking his COVID test. He's going to be there on time. I love Clyde edwards alaire I love his fit. I love his skill set inside uh, this team. Like it's it's not outlandish to me to think of Edwards Alaire being right there with Christian McCaffrey in terms of receiving work. He's not going to cr- carry the ball as many times as Kareem Hunt. I don't think. You know, he's a little bit smaller. He's a like a two oh seven guy where Kareem Hunt is two seventeen. So I don't know if they can give uh, Edwards Alaire the ball two hundred seventy times on the ground. But he might have a thousand receiving yards. I'm not projecting him for that. I'm projecting him for half of that. But this is what I'm talking about with with the potential ceiling that Edwards Alaire could hit as the featured starting running back right away. It is it is unbelievable what he could get done for fantasy. The two running backs that I have still ahead of him that you don't, Mike, I think are Derrick Henry and Josh Jacobs in half point. That's okay. Uh Kamara is still one behind Clyde edwards Alaire. Jason, I'm curious who were the two in front that so, Mike have behind. I, I have I have the uh, three in front of Clyde edwards Alaire outside of the 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 main three guys. That would be Alvin Kamara, Derrick Henry, and Dalvin Cook. But he did jump my guy Kenya Drake. Oh which was did that hurt? It hurt. It hurt. But you gotta do <laughs> what you believe is accurate. Yeah, I mean the the Number one, number two, number three, not not impossible in this offense. For I completely agree. Highest draft capital pick they had this year. Player that loved loved on film. Uh, played on the he he's just life is good. Yes, life Clyde is good. For, it is. And just a quick discussion for the backup situation. Where are you putting the chips, or where are you putting your projections? Because they did add DeAndre Washington. Uh, like I mean, he was on a division rival for a long time, and they prioritized getting him onto the team. That there's quite a few other guys. Darwin Thompson is still we, there. We know they prioritized it because it's a he's he starts with the letter D. Yes, and yes, there there is a lot of I them. Mean, but but Daryl like, Williams was okay last year. Sure, but yeah, that's I, about the best descriptor for him. I mean, DeAndre would be taking his spot. I think Darwin will have some sort of role. I doubt Darwin is cut. Who do you who did you project? Jeff? I have Daryl Williams as the main backup. Uh, DeAndre Washington kind of fits the bill here as a Clyde Edwards Hilaire mold. Where it, where if uh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire went down to injury, maybe then you've got that discussion of that receiving back. I think that's when Clyde is going to be on the field. So the the backup, the change of pace from Clyde, I see more as Daryl Williams, and I think Darwin Thompson will you know get get. Yeah, a little bit of work. And I would I would put it on DeAndre Washington. And this is just like the reminder, check your dynasty waiver wire. It, it is very possible that DeAndre's just hanging out there ready to get picked up. All right. Uh, well, we got to breeze through the rest of this news real quick before we get into the divisional breakdown. Devin Funchess. Oh. Do, do you want a farewell oh, drop for yep. Devin? Let's do it. And that's the last time you'll ever hear that drop. Probably he yeah. didn't play last year. He's one not year play deal. this year. Well, he didn't play last year because he's coming off of an ACL injury. He was as, going to play, or as Jason calls it, opting out. I, oh, yeah. <laughs> his body opted out. I think that's fair. <laughs> so bad. It's <laughs> so mean. But yeah, like a, I don't see 
Look, he might get a job, but it's it it's probably done for Funches. And, and Marquis Goodwin is in the same boat. I mean, Marquis Goodwin is a player who's been um, hurt by injuries. Yeah, he's he's had concussion problems, and he's very very fast. He could he still could have helped the Philadelphia Eagles, but him opting out it to me is actually a pretty big deal when you combine that with the the new news that was coming out of Rager saying that. They're emphasizing me to learn the X and the Z, where the news a month ago from Coach Peterson was Jalen Rager is going to focus on uh, being Deshaun Jackson's backup. He's going to learn that spot. And once once we're comfortable that he knows that spot, then maybe we'll think about implementing him to, to other parts of the offense. This came because they felt like they rushed Arthega Whiteside and it hampered him as a rookie. But now that Rager – Rager now has the potential to take over for Alshon Jeffrey, uh, who is still struggling. Alshon Jeffrey might end up on the pup and miss six weeks of the NFL season. So I am I don't normally get hyped for rookie wide receivers because it takes them a while, but of the of the bunch now, Rager is easily my top pick who uh for a rookie wide receiver who could produce fantasy value year long. Yeah, and if and if you saw that Alshon Jeffrey was placed on the pup already. He has yeah, been, so but that's the active one. pup. He can come off at any time. It's not the week one pup. So right now, when people are are going in right now, you don't don't need to worry about that. As as in, they are guaranteed to miss the first six weeks. And then Giants offensive tackle Nate Solder also opted out. Uh, I believe him and his son have had uh, cancer issues in the past, mm. and so he, he opted aware. out. He was not. I mean, he was like PFS forty sixth ranked tackle last year, but it's still. I mean, this was. During a season in which Daniel Jones suffered massive amounts of pressure all year long, it's not good to lose a no. stalwart of your offensive line, regardless of how he ranked. In uh, you know, he was obviously great in New England, so that's kind of bad news. And we've had offensive and defensive linemen opting out as well. Uh, other than that, uh, Brian Flores, head coach of the Dolphins, did say there will be an open competition at quarterback this summer. This is why it's been difficult to project. Devontae Parker yes. all off season is just wondering when the shoe would drop. When do you get Tua? And I don't, you know, if Tua wins the job, I don't throw Devontae Parker away. I mean, Tua is a right. great player, but it's it's uh, there's but a the lot more risk b baked into drafting Devontae Parker instead of knowing like, oh, I'm going to get a few games where yes. Parker's going to get off to a hot start, really help my team. And this news is coming up because they have said. To a pass is physical. He will practice without limitations, and it, we weren't sure that was actually going to happen. So when he's green light, he could win the job week one. Yeah, you manage Tua and you manage Ryan Fitzpatrick differently as a head coach. Yes, and what your goal is, but Tua is the future. So right. whether he starts or not, he's healthy. If he loses this competition, you really don't have a lot of confidence in how long Ryan Fitzpatrick will stay there. Yeah, I, I don't view this really as as any different. I mean, it is news that he's definitely not going on the pump and he's healthy that's great but that was my assumption already was that he was going to be there competing for the job but with you know with the no OTAs and the shortened uh training camp and no preseason I, th I think it would be very difficult for Tua to somehow in that situation prove that he's the guy to lead the team outside of just saying well he's the future so might as well just get the future started yeah Flores wants to win yeah you want to know who else wants to win? Who's that, Jason? Me. I want to win at dinner every <laughs> night. And so we're going to thank <laughs> Omaha Steaks for being the best way to win at uh, dinner because they are phenomenal. You meat know, winner. They are the meat winner. Meet your friends uh, with wonderfully delicious filet mignons and uh, pork chops. Is that M-E-A-T, your friends? That was, yes, 100%. Meet your friends? Meet your friends. M-E-A-T. <laughs> I mean, you gotta, you gotta surprise. Did you just verb meat? I, I live meat. <laughs> That's what I do. Pork chops, chicken, kielbasa, more. You want smoky sweet bacon, pork I, tender yes. filet mignon? Of course I do, Jason. Oh, did you just throw in more like your last name? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's it's M O O R E M E A T. More meat. Thank you, Omaha Steaks. It's phenomenal. Uh, my freezers, we were well documented. We're stocked up, and right now they're offering a steakhouse grilling package with an exclusive offer just for our listeners. It is awesome. Here's what you do: you visit OmahaSteaks.com, you type "footballers" in the search bar to shop summer grill packs today, and don't forget when you order the Grand Summer Grill Out package, 
You'll also get four Jumbo Franks and four Omaha Steak Burgers free to complete your steakhouse experience. Visit omahasteaks.com and type footballers in the search bar. Let's get divisional. All right, our final divisional breakdown show. I encourage you to head back over the last couple of weeks. We, we went through every division. We're finishing in the NFC West. We're starting with the San Francisco 49ers. Started 8-0 last year, finished 13-3. and Obviously, it was a great season in San Francisco. Uh, rushing yards per game, they were dominant. Second in the league, 144 a game. First in rushing touchdowns. We just had the news earlier this week about Raheem Mostert having mm-hmm. a uh, what a reconfigured contract. They they, they, they slipped him a little, little one ski under, under the mattress. And got rid of that problem. Uh, points per game. I mean, second in the NFL, 29.9 points per game. And it was. That is, that is biz- it just doesn't bananas, feel like I don't that. remember that at all. They, I have to believe. is That that can't just be offensive scoring, right? Were they just a great defensive well, yeah, it's, scoring it's, it's, team Points as per well? game is, is total, yeah. Uh, but points against, too. I mean, they were a great defense. We know that. Defensive uh, passing yards per game given up. They were first in the league. They, they were dominant. And this was a, a great team, and they're, and they're built to win with that Kyle Shanahan running game. No more Matt Breida. Matt Breida's gone. He was not really a factor last year after the very beginning of the season. And then their midseason acquisition, Emmanuel Sanders, to come in and be that one to try to get them you know, to the Super Bowl success, by the way. Uh, he's gone. He's in New Orleans. They added Brandon Ayuk in, in. in the first round. Which was a surprise pick. They had other options, uh, but he fit the mold. And then they're dealing with the injury to Debo Samuel. And some news came out, I believe, yesterday or the yep. day before about managing Emmanuel's, or uh, not Emmanuel Sanders, Debo Samuel's return and the likelihood that he's going to miss some time. So he's really not a. It's very difficult to make a compelling argument as to why you should draft Debo Samuel outside of a very late round pick and trying to hold him just because. It, yeah, I mean, it's going to take him some time yeah, to get we, back. Let's go to the the injury dip expert, Jason. Are yeah. you buying the injury dip? I am not buying the injury dip. Right. I don't think it usually works out for you. And in this specific situation with this specific injury, it usually has a ramp up period where when they are back on the field, it's like fake they, back. They are fake back. It is not the same production level. That's not what Justin Timberlake brought. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, he's a guy that I don't. Even if you've got an IR spot, you maybe, want sexy back. <laughs> yes, maybe, yeah. always. Maybe, maybe super late if that's, I have that's an AJ IR Green. spot. <laughs> AJ Green's bringing sexy no, back. He's, he's, Doubtful. Yeah. Look, I'm with. I hope he does. Sorry, Jason. Oh, that's all right. But I'm I'm just saying I believe that uh, Debo will get off to a slow start. And the the honest truth is, this is a well coached team. This is a a franchise that is running well right now, and they're they're wise enough to say, let's not get our player back a week or two earlier. Bigger jo- plans. Bigger plans. Bigger fish to fry. And so you look at this team, and really the the main pass catching option that we have assured on this roster is what George Kittle's. Kittle's role will be. Yes, which is, yeah. It's so fundamental to this team. He has done his fair share of uh, workout tweeting, which is always a, a really – he's working on that. The, the, that workout tweet isn't for fantasy owners. That's for that's, – He's going for the bag. That's for John Lynch. He's yes. going for the bag. He wants the extension. Well, and John Lynch just got the bag too. I don't know if you guys saw, but yes. John Lynch got extended uh, to match the contract of Kyle Shanahan. So they ha- they have their front office locked up. Yeah, they do, and and for good reason. I mean, they had a, a dominant year. George Kittle, though, uh, last year basically points per game, same same place that uh, Travis Kelsey was. Right. No reason for us to be dis- dissuaded from George Kittle's production nope, this not year. At all. Are you willing to draft him in the back of the second, like with your team makeup, the way you think about fantasy football? Will you take Travis Kelsey yeah. or George Kittle? Yeah, I would. I would, and, and I talked about this on the live stream we did earlier today. Someone was asking, am I more likely to take an earlier round tight end or an earlier round quarterback? The turnover at the quarterback position and the order that they finish and the way that that comes to fruition based on projections, it's inconsistent. Travis Kelsey's been the number one tight end for four years, Yeah, and I believe George Kittle is in that locked and loaded guaranteed category. 
They manufacture so many scoring opportunities on this team. Whether Jason believes it or not, they were the second highest in the league. I Look, I, I, I vetted it. <laughs> and when you run the ball, when you can put up 144 yards a game on the ground, you put yourself into these you know, great positions for uh, Jimmy Garoppolo and George Kittle is, is always open. So he's the locked and loaded guy on this roster. Rotating to the running back position, Raheem Mostert's back, Tevin Coleman. I'm sure if you looked at his best ball ADP, he had a really nice climb there. Looks just like a little spike on the heart monitor. Like, oh, I'm up. No, okay. <laughs> I'm back where I was. Yeah, a Tevin Coleman arrhythmia of sorts. Yeah. And then you've got Jarek McKinnon and speculation about whether he's healthy. Jeff Wilson behind him. This is a team that has functioned with multiple running backs year over year. Are you Has your confidence in Mostert being the number one guy changed at all due to this little blip? It, it hasn't for me. Uh he RB25 right now in best ball. He probably will finish higher than that. It I mean, you will have some inconsistencies. I don't mind drafting Mostert there. Like you went wide receiver heavy in the first few rounds. I, I think that Mostert can be a foundational running back. He's probably not going to be on many of my teams, though, the way that I'm I'm handling drafts and constructing things. I'm not taking a running back in the fifth round. Maybe he drops to the six and you have a value and and I draft him then, but I don't mind him, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna draft him. Yeah, the problem is that even though this team is so good at running the ball, so good, and they have two good backs that are going to produce for fantasy. Mostert will absolutely have extreme fantasy relevant a lot and, and Coleman will have his fantasy relevant games. Because they are both relevant, it kind of renders each one a little irrelevant. I don't have either guy getting to 200 carries. So the consistency that you wind up with if you're you know, 180 carry running back is sure at the end of the year, you might have scored enough touchdowns to be good. But if you're just talking about how you play fantasy football, when you're drafting guys, when you're choosing to make your start sit decisions, this is a backfield that I, I personally have been more avoiding. I know, Andy, you are... You are much higher on Moster, I think, just emotionally than um, you know than than what I. What was that again? Emotionally, I you you really like Moster, and I find myself ne never really wanting. I would rather well, I, take. I, Coleman. I think you feel that way because I went out and acquired him in leagues, right? Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you, and then now that I have him, you think that I'm loyal to him. Well, you've referred to him as a possible my guy. So Absolutely. I, yeah. So that, I mean, I he's at 21 I, in my rankings right now, but he will. It, it's just a philosophical thing. You might not be able to predict who the guy is, but they're going to put up 140 on the ground. Right. So that's that's the game you're playing, right? Great running team. I mean, you, you've dealt with this in New Orleans in years past. You don't quite know which guy's going to be. When you have the the wrench of like Jalen Hurd, who basically did nothing last year, what is he on this offense? I mean, he he played some running back in college. He's you know a a very versatile player. Does is Jalen Hurd all of a sudden in the mix of the running backs? He could he could be. I think the big difference here between this backfield and the Saints is that the Saints always throw the ball to the running back, and that hasn't been a real marker of Shanahan in, in for the 49ers. You know, if these two running backs, if neither one of them is a PPR value, then that's tough. You get the touchdowns and you get the rushing yardage or you have a really lousy game because you don't have that passing baseline. Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, they were the best running team in football. Yes. And their two running backs currently have a RB40 and RB25 ADP. That is pretty wild. So that that's... That's kind of nuts. I mean, I know Mostert. He talked a lot of big, you know, big game in the offseason. I can handle 200-plus carries. Will he get it? I don't know. Is Jarek McKinnon going to be healthy? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But you look at the passing game on a great offense that scores a ton of points, and you kind of just you throw your hands up. I mean, Jimmy Garoppolo, uh, 32 pass attempts per game. It was 29th in the NFL. Only five weeks last year in this banner season for San Francisco, five QB1 weeks from the quarterback of this team that's scoring almost 30 a game, nine weeks where he was the QB 20 or worse. So mm. it wasn't just like, oh, I just slipped outside that QB 1 range. Right. It was like, I don't exist this week. And then you do, you lose Debo Samuel, the most kind of uh, – the is he the most tenured wide receiver they had? I mean, not really. I mean, you right. have 
You have Bourne and other players, but none of these guys make you excited about the offense. Brandon Ayuk's going to be a rookie. I mean, he's a rookie coming into this team. How much of an opportunity does he get? Jalen Hurd is a rookie, essentially, coming off of a lost season. Now, so Debo Samuel, if you remember at the end of the season when he was very solid, essentially the wide receiver 17 in points per game. Uh, what do you, uh, what's the I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm laughing really hard over here because I'm looking at the roster. Oh. It's on our show, Doc. Yes. And in the smallest font that, <laughs> that, this, that Kyle Borgogan could have put into the doc, Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, Jalen Hurd, and then down there in like size five font with a little hand, is Dante Pettis' name? Yes, he, he's still there. He, hey is, guys, he is still on the team. Uh, it, but so Debo was it, it points per game. It wasn't as great as you as you remember because he was like the wide receiver six overall. But points per game, it wasn't. Uh, You're saying over the back half of the yeah, game? Yeah, when, yeah. When he really was useful for fantasy, who can step into that role? Let's say Debo misses four games. Are you willing to take uh, a, a draft? shot at Brandon Ayuk who I mean very similar player yes. to Debo that this is they're going to try and get him the ball uh two yards ahead of the line of scrimmage and see what he can do and Ayuk is in the 14th round yeah, I mean if, sure I mean okay, well you, you could take a 14th round pick here's here's my thought on that is Kyle Shanahan in the offense I mean it was, it was a first round wide receiver Absolutely. In the draft. Absolutely. Like people are hyped no, no, no. for I, Rager, I'm, Jefferson, Judy, Lamb. The rest of the words out of my mouth were to say, sure, because Kyle Shanahan puts players in a position to succeed. He's a high draft capital player, and they don't have other wide receivers. It's just a matter of predicting how often or when you could possibly play this guy. Week to week. I mean, we, we see him do it with the backfield. It doesn't matter the name in the backfield for Kyle Shanahan. He figures out a way to get production out of it. There's no reason he can't throw Brandon Ayuk four screen passes. I think Ayuk is interesting for a player that perhaps you draft him with your last pick. See what happens on week one, and you might have a very powerful trade asset come week two. Because if he, have, if he has back-to-back -back successful games – Knowing in your head that Don that Dante Pettis, knowing in your head that Debo Samuel is coming back, I don't know. Maybe you got a trade chip there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the, interesting. The hard part about this is K Kendrick Bourne is there; he'll be utilized. Uh, Trent Taylor is there. We mm -hmm. forget about him. He's not even listed on this board, but he's number two on the depth chart. So, and they don't pass the ball a lot. And I, they don't pass the ball. I, and re you know, I don't want any part of this passing game that's not George Kittle. That's where I stand. I think All that's right. what that story might have. Into them. Yeah, that might yeah. have been the last page of the book. Really, the only two players that I'm looking at in a draft from the 49ers, which is so weird for a team that scored the second most in the league, is Tevin Coleman because of where he's being drafted. He's being drafted as if he has no chance to be the week one starter, which I don't think that's true. I think there's a chance you come out and it's Tevin Coleman just like it was last year when these guys were on the roster. Um, and, uh, and then George Kittle. That's it. Yeah. I think Trent Taylor will be the leading wide receiver for this team through the first five, week, five weeks of the season. He could be. Um, 33 yards a game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dominant slot performance from Trent Taylor. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about the I – mean, we're in the NFC best, mm. so we've got to continue to go through playoff contenders. The Seattle Seahawks were 11-5 and five last year, 10-2 and two in one-score games. Not an anomaly when you have Russell Wilson. Right. It is It is very You're never telling. Out. You know, we talked about the Packers, how they had, yeah. you know, a, a, a very heavy win percentage in close games, and, and now the Seahawks. Sometimes it's just you, your quarterback. Sometimes it's just like, oh, yeah, when when games are close, who's got the better well, quarterback? It's, it's just their – it's their formula. Like, and Chris Carson was great. We'll get into him for, for fantasy, but their formula has been run – Run. Oh, crap. Third and long. Okay, Russell, can you bail us out? <laughs> bail us out again, Russ. And then Russell Wilson does something amazing, and they're like, sweet. Run it up the middle. <laughs> they just don't. Like, and, and then it ends up that you, you win the game in, and, and then, in a one-score game. And then in the fourth quarter, we're down. Yeah. And there's like, oh, shoot. Russ, <laughs> can you bail us out? Like, Boom. Russ, Russ, we really – look, I'm sorry. We really thought it was going to work this time. This game plan, this this run run, here's we the thought it was going to work. Here's the problem. Blow people out, Seattle. Yeah, it's always worked. 
Yeah, every, that is. Yeah, because Russell Wilson. Listen, is every great. year of Russell Wilson's career, 11 and 5, 13 and 3, 12 and 4, 10 and 6, 10 and 5, 9 and 7, 10 and 6, yes. 11 and 5. He's very good. They always win. If you are Pete Carroll and you're chewing the bubble gum, eating the peach cobbler, and you're sitting there going, boy, I should keep doing what I'm doing because it always works. He's the uh, Russell's amazing. The the hashtag that let let Russ cook. Yes. You know? Um I don't think it happens. Not no. to the degree that anybody wants. He is the only quarterback no. with thirty passing touchdowns each of the last three seasons. It won't happen. And then again it'll be Russ. Look, man, we really thought it was gonna work this time. But it does. <laughs> but here's hundreds of millions of dollars instead. Uh, uh but Russell Wilson, he's the QB five right now. That's where he's being drafted in the sixth round. We I, know the story. I will say this. While I don't think it's Pete Carroll's intention to let Russ cook and allow them to be, as as Russell Wilson said this offseason, to be more like the Kansas City Chiefs offense where they, you know, he's the center and he's able to uh, air it out. They've got a wide receiving core that could get this done with Lockett and Metcalf. Mm -hmm. um, so while it's not the intention, the running back room is getting – a little bit limited. If Chris Carson, who has an injury history, goes down to injury and Penny isn't ready to start the season, and you know you you wind up with basically Carlos it's Hyde. Carlos Hyde, then yeah. I think you have to let Russ cook. So in drafts, nah. in drafts, Carlos I, Hyde can handle two thousand carries. <laughs> I mean, he he was a thousand yard rusher last year, so the point is is taken there. Um, but my point is that in Russell's range of outcomes. Even if it's not the okay, yeah, coaching yeah, sure. intention, I think you could see an uptick, a significant uptick in his passing attempts this season. That being said, they added Jamal Adams oh, to this that. defense. This is a defense that was 22nd in defensive rushing yards per game given up, um, 27th in passing yards per game given up, 22nd in points against. If you want to let Russ cook, it's going to be harder if they start shutting people down with Jamal Adams. I do think that, you know, just as Russell's career continues, DK Metcalf's evolution, they're going to give him more opportunities to do it. Uh, he'll make a few meals. They may not let him cook every week, but yeah. he'll, he'll make some really – Postmates a few things. Nice meals. Uh, let's talk about the backfield. Uh, Chris Carson, right now being drafted as the RB18. Is that the right spot for him? It's it, – we've had concern about him because the dude broke his hip at the end of the season, and that's – you know. That could be a pretty serious injury, but the the actions of the team have said when they signed Carlos Hyde is that we fully expect that Chris Carson is going to be back. Rashad Penny, the you know former first rounder, his injury is much more significant, an ACL tear in week 14. He's not going to be ready to start the season. Chris Carson should be our injury expert. Matthew Betts uh, took a look, and he, he fully expects Chris Carson to – to be there when the year starts. And if that is the case, RB18 is way too low yeah, for I mean, Chris Carson. He's in this group of players he, he with was a lot a of beast last a year. A lot of variables. You know, you got Todd Gurley changing teams, David Johnson changing teams, Lev Bell coming off of a terrible year, and you're hoping that the offensive line is better. And then Chris Carson is in that group when you're looking at drafting him. Drafting him. Yes, he has the hip injury, but it – isn't supposed to get in the way of the timeline. He's on the same team. His back, you know, backup is injured from last season. They're a great 47, offense. 47 targets. I he mean, was the running bad. back 11 last year, but remember, he got injured at the very end of the year, and at the beginning of the year, you have had the fumbling problem where he, you know, those first three yes. weeks were a little rough. And even with that, he really only busted once. I mean, he had, he had a couple blips where it was – Ah, I'm a little disappointed in this output, but once he firmly took the job, he was unstoppable. From that point until the end the injury, of the season yes. when he got you, injured, he was the running back eight. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, 18 is, is Way too, too low. low. Do you think you'll be moving him closer towards the yes, season then? I do. I think he will move up in my rankings as we get closer and confirm that the, what our expectation is on the injury. Why do people continue to doubt Tyler Lockett? The last two seasons, wide stupid. receiver – <laughs> wide receiver 13 and wide receiver 16 the last two years. Right now being drafted as the wide receiver 22. Would you rather have Tyler Lockett or T.Y. Hilton? Lockett. Oof, that's a, that's a tough question. I th they seem similar to me. Oh, yeah. They do, but, but and, and I've 
I was going to join in with Jason. Of like, I'm not doubting Tyler Lockett, but when you when you're playing fantasy and looking at the range of outcomes, it is possible that Metcalf becomes the wide receiver one. I'm not projecting that at all. Meanwhile, for T.Y. Hilton, I don't think anyone else on that team you can know, surpass him. And that just almost outlines what happens with Tyler Lockett every – I almost combined them, T.Y. Lockett. Right. Uh, with Tyler Lockett every year, he's he's being drafted as the wide receiver 22. He finished at wide receiver 13 and 16. Yet I bet I could name 21 other wide receivers and have you pick them before Probably. you pick Tyler Lockett. Probably, and that's that should not happen. And part of that – I look, excitement for D.K. Metcalf – no question, but there's a mind meld there with Russell Wilson and Tyler Lockett the past two years when you need a big play. I think we were coming into last offseason, what, Tyler Lockett was this, the the passer rating, right? Was it a oh, per- yeah, it perfect was, passer rating yes. from Russell Wilson yes, to two Tyler years, Lockett? Two years ago, it was just what he did was not sustainable. I mean, you did a, an AWS commercial with yes. a catch in the back of the end zone that was not possible, but Tyler Lockett pulled it off. And – well, that's what I liked about last season for Lockett was he's like, well, that would, what he did wasn't impossible like what he did two years ago. So that's why I'm, I'm far more in on Tyler Lockett for his draft price. And and I still think so. To me, when You're I look at Tyler Lockett, back to back, by the way, Lockett and Metcalf. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I I have no hesitations, no doubts. I you know sometimes you've got to take. And you feel like, well, I, I totally recognize that the opposite could happen. I would be shocked if Metcalf is the wide receiver one for this team. Now, if it if it's on the back of more touchdowns, but he has far less targets and at the end of the year, sure. But Tyler Lockett's ceiling is higher than what we've seen. We talked about, you know, let Russ cook. If the passing volume goes up, Tyler Lockett could be dominant for fantasy. You look at his last 180 targets, it's basically what... You know, it's 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 better than Julio's. It's better than, uh, you know, it's it's what Michael Thomas has been doing. He is a great wide receiver for a great quarterback. If they throw the ball more, I think he's a safe baseline, still with upside that people just don't see. The the troubling part, I'm looking at the uh, Tyler Lockett DK Metcalf experience from week uh, from the bye on last year. It's not pretty. Not many weeks that you wanted to play them. I mean, there was well, one. That's because you had the Russell Wilson disappearing. Act. Did for fantasy yep. he disappeared? Yes. Yeah, yeah, and I guess it's a little bit scary, and maybe that's why their draft. You know, everybody respects Russell Wilson, yet his top two receivers are in the fifth round. Right. That's probably that correlation. Mm-hmm. Greg Olson, do you have any hope for Greg Olson at the tight end position on I, a team that continuously finds a way to make the tight end position relevant? I do. <laughs> Yeah, look, how does it feel though? It, it doesn't feel great. Uh, Greg Olson, the his former team, the Panthers, have said we need to part ways. But the Seahawks, he's already signed a contract to be an announcer. <laughs> yes, the, but the Seahawks use the tight end position. Hollister, Jacob Hollister, and Will Disley last year combined for 18 red zone targets. And if you want to like compare that, George Kittle at 17. So if Greg Olson is the starter for this team, as he should be, I mean they, they paid him to be the starter for this team. I don't believe that Will Disley can return this year from his injury. Greg Olson has the ceiling is not great, but as a late round tight end, I think he's going to be safe and you could play him every week and, and, and get enough from the position. I tend to agree. Greg Olson, Jack Doyle. Ooh, probably Doyle, probably still Doyle for me. I mean, if Disley can't come back, it's it's easily Greg Olson to me just because of the touchdown upside with Russ around the red zone. Did you see Frank Reich talking up Trey Burton today? I don't doubt it. <laughs> He's I mean, completed worked... the full round. Every player has been talked up by Frank Reich now. They've they've worked together. I I every time I've brought up Trey Burton, I've been I'm not, shut I'm down. I'm not in on it. Well, it's... yeah, you should be. No, I shouldn't. He may hurt Jack Doyle, but he won't help us. Well, all right. Well, the I'm nice thing in. about fantasy is we'll see. I, Greg Olson in 14 games we last saw. year. <laughs> Greg, 14 games for Greg Olson last year with the terrible quarterback play still had almost 600 yards. Like, Greg Olson, Joni Smith. I, I'm going to take the upside. I'll take the upside for Joni. Yeah. All right. Uh, the LA Rams were 9-7 and seven last year. It was tough. It was tough. It was. For Jared Goff dealing with the offensive line play. They ranked 31st last year. That was a bit of a step back. To 31. The O-line? Yeah, and uh, you know that's according to Pro Football Focus. Tied for the league lead in pass attempts. Jared Goff was back there chucking it. 
Uh, but dealing with a, a troublesome offensive line, he looked skittish at times. He made mistakes. You didn't see the same kind of production on a consistent basis out of this offense. Didn't throw the ball to Todd Gurley. Todd Gurley's now gone. Brandon Cook's now gone. They invested two second-round picks on offensive players. Cam Akers, running back out of Florida State. Van Jefferson, wide receiver. To come in and help. But what are your expectations for this offense in a very tough division after seeing what you saw last year, right? Like the armor was broken down. And it was broken down in the Super Bowl the year before. Right. And then we came back and we said, well, this is, this is Sean McVay. He'll have things figured out. And, you know, they weren't bad. And but, he did. It took him some time, and that was what was unfortunate. But towards the end of the season, he figured things out. He got it right. And I, I love a coach. I'm always going to side with a coach who can adapt, who can change. And, of course, we want to get off to a hot start in fantasy. We want to start week one great. But I trust McVay still. And with Brandon Cooks being gone and new you know, personnel being there, when I look at Cooper Cup and Robert Woods, I, I love both of these players. Like I love them for fantasy. I think that they are going to be outstanding this year. They're going to have to rely on the passing game a little bit more, going from Gurley to uh, a rookie in a committee uh, backfield with an offensive line that isn't going to be op- able to open up holes the way they would want them to. So more, I, more than passing more than every team in the league last year? I mean, or, or similarly, a just to the same, de- same exactly, degree. A, a continuation of that. And both of those guys were very fantasy relevant last year, and that's with Robert Woods only getting two touchdowns on the season. Yeah, I expect that number to obviously change. There were a lot of heads-up questions on the live stream today about Robert Woods or this guy, Robert Woods or that guy. I love Robert Woods. Robert Woods or A.J. Brown in a PPR. Well, I'm going to side with Robert Woods in that equation. Robert Woods is a as close to a lock for, what, 85 receptions as almost anybody in football on a team that passes the ball more than anybody in football. I have both guys inside my top 12, which is probably one of the, uh, you know, hot takey wide I don't receiver think, I don't think it's hot takey. You know, no. I have uh, Woods and Cup at 9 and 10, and they're going in the fourth round. Who do they're you being have drafted as the eight. I have Woods one spot higher than Cup now. All right. In half point. But they're being drafted as the wide receiver 18 and the wide receiver 14. Why is that? Why uh, are they, why are they that down there? I, well, I would say let's take it one at a time, right? Because they're different reasons. With Robert Woods, he's he's lower because he's not a sexy pick. He's not a 10-touchdown, top-five wide receiver upside. He's just solid. He's just going to get 130 targets, be really, really good, unfortunately not have a, a high enough touchdown volume to get him to elite that you don't want him. But he is as safe as it comes. Uh, and then with Cooper Cup, the issue there is range of outcomes. I mean, you want to yeah. talk about a guy who I believe has the ability to be a top five wide receiver, has shown it. I mean, he's been a top five wide receiver for massive stretches of his career, but then you have the fear of what happened last year when they changed kind of their scheme, and all of a sudden, Robert Woods was still on the field, 98% of the snaps, and Cooper Cup's down there in the 60s, and they're trying to change how they're playing, and Cooper Cup was still good. He had touchdowns in those games. Yeah, he was, kind of bailed. He scored touchdowns. Yeah, right. It, 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 he was bailed out there. But I believe this coming season, those two players will be on the field ninety percent of the play. So I am in on Cooper Cup. But is that in eleven personnel or twelve personnel? I believe that all of the the data on where Cooper Cup thrives and struggles, I think, is a misnomer because of how much. They've played a certain way, and so Mike, why don't you give the data that you're worried about uh, of of personnel usage? Well, this is over that five game span that we're yeah, going to yeah. bring up again. <laughs> it's important. Yeah. Okay, I, I I don't know why you doubt it. Like it's they went fi- their offense was was not great for most of the season. I mean, you still you, you brought up how he had to throw the ball more than anybody else, but he wasn't. He Jared Goff was not dominating, and then those final five games when they made the switch to really being uh, twelve personnel, be, having two wide receivers on the field, they featured Tyler Higby. And then Jared Goff just he went off like in those five games. I mean, he was throwing. They played Arizona twice. Those that was the worst tight end coverage team in the league. They played San Francisco and Seattle, which was the second to worst and third to worst tight end team out of the five games. So they exploited. A situation in five games okay. that 
And that would be my counter argument. That's a good counter. And it, and it's not that they won't do it. And Ty, I I picked Tyler Higby in a bunch of heads up today just for the upside because if a player like Tyler Higby can do what he did in five games, a lot of tight ends can't. Right. My my thought is just you know, my my point for Cooper Cup being great is that you can't run this offense without Cooper Cup. I mean, you cannot. They have nobody else. I mean, they have Robert Woods and Cooper Cup, and they throw the ball more than everybody. You know, I I don't know what they're going to do on offense. I I know that they dominated in that form, but we sat here and talked about T.J. Hawkinson against Arizona in Week One last year, and I just don't like overemphasizing that. That's my only point. Okay, but you're willing to take the chance on Higby in the in the back of the seventh or the early eighth. He's being drafted as the tight end seven right now. Yeah. Wow. Like I, I, a lot of Higby that, respect right there. Yeah, I and mean, uh, it. I think that's just both where. I see people say that's way it's still way too early. But like you're saying, not everyone no. in that opportunity is going to dominate like the way that Tyler Higby did. So without question. I believe they saw they found something. Tyler Higby is paid right now as well by yeah. this team. So I like him. I like taking the chance on him as as the seventh tight end off the board. I think that the tight end position will be valuable. But Gerald Everett does scare me. Gerald Everett was not around when Tyler Higby really went off. It's Everett, fair. Everett in his own right, had a really nice stretch right before he got injured. So I think they're going to utilize the tight end more, uh, and it's going to be productive. But I do worry about it. It's I don't think it's going to be a one man show at tight end, barring an injury from either one of those guys. Everett had a number five finish in week four, a number two finish in week five. That's what I mean. Number five finish in week seven. You put the tight end position together. If you together, put those together. They're great. Yeah. But, you know, when they're both healthy. Can I they both be effective? I mean, we talk about Ertz and Goddard, and you lose Brandon Cooks, and you have what you talked about in the backfield, which we'll talk about here briefly, the, you know, with Akers and Henderson and Brown. Will they have to rely on both, and will that be – you know, it's will possible. be viable to it, play both. It is possible. We we saw, uh, you know, the, a couple of years ago when Brandon Cooks was was healthy and this team ran through the wide receivers, you saw multiple people, three wide receivers, all have fantasy value. So I think that it is possible that they can, that both tight ends can do something. But I'm still taking the chance on. Do either Higby. of you have this team finishing ahead of Seattle or San Francisco? No, no. Uh, Cam Akers, right now being drafted as the running back 26. Uh, they ignored Gurley in the passing game last year. I think one of the big question marks out of Akers and Henderson, are they going to throw the ball to the running back position again? Daryl Henderson, only 43 touches in his rookie season. Malcolm Brown is still around. That's that's his actual, that's the quote. Malcolm Brown's around. <laughs> um, Round town of Malcolm Brown. <laughs> <laughs> he'll probably get, you know, he'll probably get the goal line respect. In he that, will in that backfield. He will definitely annoy fantasy owners from time to time because he's a he's a solid veteran back, but he's not good enough to be fantasy relevant or get the usage. So for fantasy purposes, it's 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 just someone eating into the share that we hope goes to Cam Akers according to average draft position. Do you, are you willing to take Cam Akers in the fifth round right now? No, with the. Good offense, not knowing the situation. I, I guess it's just, do you believe that Cam Akers can be Todd Gurley light? I think he can. I So I, I said, no, I won't take him. I believe he can talent-wise. Um, whether or not he gets the usage, whether he's given the opportunity to do that is the big question. And I, I you know, this is... We've talked about it. You know, no OTAs, no preseason. It's going to be slower sledding, you know, unless... Like well, it's, what happened it's so with hard. Clyde edwards alaire and the other backfield clears it up for you. That's what I say. It's so hard because Cam Akers' draft capital is the fifth. Or where, where was he drafted? Sec I thought he was the second was round. Was he second? Did he go second round? I can, I can vet it real quick. But I believe it was the second round, yes. I they didn't this, have situa a, this situation uh, could clear up real quick. It was their first it could, pick. It could, yes. It could clear up really quickly. Todd Gurley's out the door. Yes, you have McVay coming out and saying, oh, boy, I'd love to use a committee. A committee works in the NFL. 52nd overall second round. Yeah, I'm fine with Cam Akers. I'm in on Cam in the fifth. Well, let me give give some fuel to that fire. Todd Gurley was not utilized in the passing game, right? 
Well, he wasn't targeted. Exactly. That is wrong. He was very involved in the passing game. He ran uh, – he was near the top of the league in routes ran. Yeah, hey, I believe it was six that the running back – He also led in worthless routes ran. <laughs> well, yeah, I, clearly. Look, it's, here is my narrative street take of what happened with the Rams last year. They didn't – the team didn't know at the beginning of the year, but they found out really quick that Todd Gurley is, is toast. They found out that he can't get it done – that's why he's running routes and not getting targeted. They're saying it's this is a waste of the, of our time to throw you the ball. And the McVay offense needs like the running back is an engine for this team. I think that's why they spent, spent their, their money, first yeah. pick on Cam Akers. So it's it's definitely a sketchy pick because this is I mean this is just mad scientist stuff that I'm throwing out right now. And they went but with a guy that already knew how to play without an offensive line. That is also very <laughs> yes. true. That is very true. If you watch the, the Florida tape from Cam oh Akers. Oh, my gosh. But he, that's why I think they took him with their first pick, and it could end up being just Cam Akers is getting humongous opportunity for you, fantasy. You don't spend that pick when you have limited capital on a running back. If you think Daryl Henderson, most teams. If do you, not, if you think Daryl Henderson's your future, and Malcolm Brown, Daryl Henderson last year, okay, three point seven, three point eight a carry. Don't worry about that. The offensive line struggled. They so, didn't see so, what they needed to see. So there's teams that do it, Oft, like, like Rashad Penny. Oftentimes, when yeah. you look back yeah, and fair. and at, at the decisions you've made, I've I've heard in life, just in general, no, specifically oh, okay. to fantasy football. Um, a lot of times you want you you look back and you say, man, my first instinct was the correct one before all the hype train and the camp reports and all of this. I do remember when I did all the research post draft, went and watched all the press conferences, tried to watch every GM and head coach talk about their draft picks. I put cam Akers at the top of the, he was my number one running back. Once we were past the clear Clyde Edwards, Alaire, John Taylor. Taylor. Um, it was based on what the Rams said and their situation. I think there is, Certainly a uh, a ceiling that is exciting for Cam Akers. Favorite tape I watched outside of those, uh, outside of maybe Jonathan Taylor. Least favorite tape I watched, but f favorite player. I hated watching the <laughs> offensive point. line. That's yeah, it was like pain. It was like <laughs> let brutal. the guy get the ball, not surrounded by defenders. Once he ran away from the offensive line, occasionally he's really great. dynamic. He's very player. good. All right, became Cam Akers hour on the show. It did well. Maybe that'll be a new segment. The Game Makers Hour? I hope so. Uh, <laughs> he has to earn that. All right. We're on to the Cardinals. Last year, 5 10 and 1. Really bad defensive performance last year for Arizona. We mentioned not being able to cover the tight end, but the offense made some big strides. And it especially it looked very interesting when Kenyon Drake arrived, when Cliff Kingsbury had the opportunity to get acclimated as an NFL head coach. And this is one of the teams that, you know, you have a pretty interesting, you got a quarterback that could be tier one. You got a wide receiver that could be tier one. Do you have a running back in Kenyon Drake that could be tier one, Jason? Yeah. Uh, you don't have a running back that could be <laughs> tier one. I think you have a running back that is tier one. And and I, I guess tier one, I don't know the he'll You were get. thinking round one, but yes, yeah. uh, he's certainly a first round running back. I think he'll be worthy of that. When he arrived on the scene, he was pretty much great every week except for one. He was involved in the passing game. He was involved in the running game. His uh, ability to hit a top in, you know, next gen stats, his top in speed was outstanding. And that shows how he's getting the ball in space in this offense. Now, he, we've, I've had this conversation about this player before that in the stretches where he's been given the opportunity he's been great and over the course of his career that is no longer a short sample size he's never had a full opportunity so that is the narrative against him that he won't receive sure. what we all want him to receive this year I know Andy believes Chase Edmonds will be a little bit more involved um, than, than I certainly do Chase, Chase Edmonds was not involved at all even when he got back from injury when Kenyon Drake was well, there at the David end, David Johnson was still here. Yes, that that is that is true. That's a fair uh, counterpoint. But I believe that the opportunity will be given to him. And when you look at the transactions that were made, shipping David Johnson out, doing a, a transition tag of ten million dollars on Drake. Yeah, he's getting paid. I mean, he's the guy. <laughs> do you you remember the big 
Chase Edmonds game that everybody played David Johnson instead of Chase Edmonds? Yes. Is that week it was seven? Tw- 27 carries, 126 yes. yards, three touchdowns against the Giants. You know how many carries he – I mean, he got hurt. But but how many you know carries, carries the rest of the season he had? Six. You're close. It's eight. Yeah. Eight carries. Yeah. But, and, uh, and the Cardinals running back position, my favorite stat to give is if you take the starter, we didn't always know – that it was going to be Chase Edmonds, like you thought it was going to be David Johnson, and you weren't sure that it was going to be Kenyon Drake when they trade for him. And it, it, there's a, it was a mess. But whoever but the Cardinals used as their running back one for that game was the number. Th- if you take all those points, it's the number three overall running back. Like that's in the range of outcomes for Kenyon Drake. Yeah, no, no question. And Kenyon Drake, they love him. He's a great fit in Arizona. This is the first time you got to see him in that system that just fit. It just fit. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins. Oh yeah, he's on the card. I mean, we we could absolutely like. Do I <laughs> have? Do dangerous. I still have that drop in here? We could not talk about him at all, which would be fine. I mean, we know he's a great player. It's just a matter of managing your expectations for him. He's being drafted as the wide receiver four. Are you Is in he on that? Really? I did not realize he was being drafted as the wide receiver four. I believe Hopkins has a great season. I know, Mike, you have a lower target volume in yeah, this I'm, offense I'm, I'm for him. I'm a little skeptical. I don't like when wide receivers change teams like this, but I don't – I do, would we, not, do we have an example of a – I think Hopkins is either like the number one or number two wide receiver on this NFL list that is happening, right? You know, you're the top 100 players. Have we had the number <laughs> – like a top three wide receiver traded in the peak of their career? So I, I don't know if we have you had an Ter- actual example. You had for Terrell this. Owens switching teams when he was in the peak of his uh, career, and he was and great. he was great. You had Brandon Marshall. Uh, I don't know that he was at that caliber. Uh, yeah, I within, wouldn't put him on the Hopkins but, scale, but he did great. And I I believe that Hopkins. I I mean, look, yeah, like you said, the top 100 players are going on right now. He's one of the only wide receivers in the top 10, and uh, of all positions, I'll say this based off of just like what they had to give up in the trade. They don't really value Hopkins that much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Expiring contract. David Johnson and a second round pick gets you DeAndre Hopkins. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. The, thanks, all, thanks, Bill. <laughs> all that being said, I would not draft him as the fourth wide receiver off the board. I have him ranked right now as my wide receiver five, but like we've said, you have to look at range of outcomes, not just a linear draft ranking. It was like the trade happened all over again for me. Oh, yeah? When the NFL and the NFLPA reached their agreement for the 2020 mm, season. Yeah. It, you know, you, you do things both in fantasy and reality to like protect yourself against the risk of like, do I not get to see Kyler Murray and yeah, DeAndre yeah, yeah. Hopkins this year? And then they got that deal done and I was like, we have DeAndre Hopkins in Arizona? It's pretty cool. So... He's not going to have the same target market share that he's had while he's getting these 170 target you know, seasons uh, as a Houston Texan. Um, he's been living at the 30% target market share, which is you know, outlandish to repeat. It's elite. Unless you're DeAndre Hopkins. Sure. But if he goes down, I've got him down at 23% market share, which I think is that's fair. I, that's I feel like fair. that's near his floor for being as elite as he is. And with the expected uptick in pace of play and passing plays from the Cardinals, that puts him at 141 targets. I think that's going to be a great season for Hopkins. But, Mike, you, where are you at on the targets? Because I know you, when you were digging in, you saw something different. Well, it's just the, the way that Arizona plays. Like you said, the Houston Texans formula was throw the ball to, to DeAndre Hopkins. And meanwhile, Arizona spreads it out. They're running four wide receivers out. So, I mean, the auxiliary players are getting targets. It's who's open. They ha- they didn't force feed anybody. DeAndre Hopkins' skill certainly can dictate that you have to throw me the ball, but that's that's simply my concerns where I've you know uh, taken, taken my projections for him down compared to what Hopkins has been doing the past couple of years. Are, are fantasy owners going to need to pay attention to Christian Kirk or Larry Fitzgerald at all this year? I think look, I, I'm I've been rising on Kirk. I, we have we've forgotten how bad Kirk actually got hurt, and it, I, that was highlighted to me, in fact, by Christian Kirk yes. on ah, Twitter. Good where, source. Where I can't remember if he tweeted it or if he was just retweeting it, but he they were talking about in this tweet how 
we're giving the benefit of the doubt to these players like Saquon, who had a terrible ankle injury that he just played through. And Kirk, Kirk's like, yeah. I rem- it's like pointing it out happened, that it happened early last year. That, well, week four. Yeah, that Kirk had an ankle injury, yeah. and he was he was still he still flashed. We still saw enough of of Kirk that maybe he's not as as dead for fantasy as I have spent most of the off season thinking. He's a quality wide receiver for an offense that projects to be fast, have to score a lot of points, and have the ability to score. So I, I think he should be looked at later in drafts as it, it, now. Is he the wide receiver too? I have him as the wide receiver too yeah, ahead no of Larry question. Fitzgerald. No question. Agreed. Yeah. No question. Just wanted to have the question right. and answer it. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think Christian Kirk is fine. I don't know if he's going to be able to battle the targets away from Dan Arnold, the postman. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the postman always delivers. Tight end. Has, has Dan Arnold been the last pick of of your draft? In in uh, pretty much whenever. Yes. If I'm in like a twenty plus round draft. Uh, I love my last pick being Dan Arnold, tight end for the Arizona. How many Cardinals. people out there are still still don't know who that who that is? <laughs> well, everybody else who hasn't listened to this podcast okay. now. Owl Borland found the tweet. <laughs> Excellent work, producer Al. Uh, and, and someone had tweeted out said, "How come if Saquon plays through an ankle injury, everyone gives him the benefit of the doubt, but if Christian Kirk does it, then he must suck for having bad efficiency while playing through the injury." <laughs> And Christian Kirk retweeted it and said, "Say it louder for the people in the back, please." Well, sure, you got to believe in yourself, Mike. Just got to believe in yourself. Just saying, it was it was just a reminder of, oh yeah, he was hurt. So all these weapons. Let's say sometimes. Christian Kirk is great, and we know Kenyon Drake can catch it out of the backfield, and of course Dan Arnold will probably be the best tight end in the yeah, history of yes. the league. Uh, the last hyperbole aside, all of this goes to Kyler Murray. Correct. The passing volume mixed with the rushing volume uh, he was near 100 carries last season that is an outstanding number uh it's only been done it's, twice it's so funny like sorry you, you can give your stat but just of how how much kyler murray ran but now the the bar has been moved so far by lamar jackson yeah. where you're like 500 rushing yards what Ew. a loser <laughs> get it together kyler <laughs> ew <laughs> But Kyler legitimately could have 100 rushing attempts and 500 passing attempts. Right. And for fantasy football, that is absolute gold. That's only been done two times in Ooh. NFL history. It was rookie Cam Newton, uh, who finishes the quarterback four, and in 2002, Dante Culpepper, who finishes the quarterback oh, one. man, Dante Culpepper. That was a good yes. year. Yes. Blast from the past. And I don't think that there's anybody out there that doesn't acknowledge what the ceiling is for Kyler Murray. Yes. It's huge. But is his floor Baker? Can he Baker? Because Baker last year was no. the guy who's getting Odell Beckham. Uh, he had a great rookie season. If Baker could run, Baker wouldn't have Bakered. I, I completely agree. That's <laughs> that's the difference. That's the quote of the day. <laughs> the rushing baseline that Kyler can provide. But he, but he's Baker. Yeah. So, so Baker Bakered. Right. That's yeah, fair. Baker that's Bakered because he because he's Baker because he's Baker. Yeah. yeah. It's not Kyler. No, I don't think Kyler can Baker. He could certainly he could certainly struggle. Can he candlestick Maker? Uh, he could candlestick maker. All right. Yeah. Uh, look, you have you have a tale of of rookies make the leap, and when they make the leap, it's great. It's huge. It's not a small leap. When that year one to year two, the Lamar, Lamar, Lamar Jackson, Jackson leap, that's something that happens frequently. Carson Wentz did it right. MVP candidate year two, boom. Patrick Welcome. Mahomes. Welcome to the party, Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> hey. Although Patrick that was Mahomes kind of was his, year one. That was kind well, of his first I mean, year. You know, he, it was his second year technically. Yeah, yeah it was. But, but Wentz, Lamar. What a jump. They're really big examples of that. <laughs> but you can Baker. You can Trubisky. Uh, yeah. but, but because Kyler plays for my hometown team, he's not going to do that. So, um, Will you take him in the fifth? At the, at the end of the fifth? Certainly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because you did, Mike, and I do what you do. Well, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm a very smart person. Thank you. All right, that'll do it for the divisional breakdowns. We're done, guys. We got through well, it. Well, we made it. And obviously that was a countdown to the Super Bowl champion, and we ended. It was in reverse order. So this is the Super Bowl champion. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. That's great news for us as Cardinals fans. Yeah. Yep, Super Bowl champs. Glad we didn't talk about the defense. <laughs> and nor will we. Yeah. Fantasy football is great. All right, that is it for the episode. Definitely check out the Ultimate Draft Kit at ultimatedraftkit.com. And like Jason said so confusingly at the top of the show, mm. we have shows every single day next week. 
Yes. Except for Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, no Saturday show this week, but we will be back Monday. It is the Ice and Fire show. Many have oh, asked when it was happening. It's yeah. happening on Monday. See you then. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. And Foot Clan Omaha Steaks Grand Summer Grill Out Package lets you stay home and eat like you're at the best steakhouse in town. We're talking Omaha Steaks, bacon wrap, filet mignons, plus pork chops, chicken, kielbasa, and more delivered to your door. Meet Visit, yourself. Meet yourself. <laughs> Visit omahasteaks.com and type footballers in the search bar to shop summer grill packs today. And this week only, Omaha Steaks will add four burgers and four gourmet jumbo franks free with your order.